Eric. Mr. Secretary. How are you, my friend? Great to see you. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you so much. How are you Thank doing? Thank you for doing this. Are you good? Family I is am, good? Everybody's good. Thank you. I hope yours too. No, yes, everybody's good. Knock on wood. Thank you. We're blessed. It's a complicated time, isn't it? Very challenging times. Yeah. Indeed. I'm happy to be here with you. Are we live now, guys? We are live. Good. Good. So I, I understand that you wanted to sort of begin the conversation, but I'm happy to begin it if you'd like. Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy for everybody who's joining us to be here with Enrique Sala because he's one of my heroes who has been uh, on the front lines. No, seriously, he's been just one of the pioneers, explorers, who is trying to figure out our connection to this incredible place called the planet and to the dangers that we human beings are creating for ourselves. And there's, there's nobody who's sort of thought about it more or done more since Jacques Cousteau, who was, uh, I know, Enrique's role model and hero also. So tell us a little bit, just share with everybody, so how did you come to this quest? Um, what motivated you? What excited you about it? And, and uh, and, and fill in a few of the years, the most recent ones, I guess. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for finding time for this and, and for your hyperbolic uh, words. So, yeah, like many, like many other people, I know you were also very inspired by Jacques Cousteau. I was a little boy growing up in Catalonia, in Spain, watching the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. And that's all I wanted to do with my life. But I was a little, I was born a little late to be a diver in the famous Calypso. So I studied biology and long story short, I became a professor of marine biology at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla in California, studying the impacts of humans. Start? When did you do that, Enrique? In nine, I went to Scripps in 97. Okay. And I was studying the impacts of fishing and global warming in the ocean. And one day I realized that all I was doing was writing the obituary of the ocean with more and more data. And yeah. that was frustrating. So I quit academia and I came to National Geographic to propose something bold to go after the last wild places in the ocean and try to, to get them protected before it's too late. And the bold protection, the bold concept that you proposed to National Geographic was that you become sort of a resident explorer pursuing this project for them. Is that right? That's correct. Exploring residents, which is an oxymoron, right? Explorers are supposed to be out there. So yeah, we, uh, I propose to combine the things that National Geographic is, is known for, exploration, research, media, to work with communities and inspire country leaders to, to get places protected. And I have to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the crucial role you had to get so many of these big areas protected in the ocean and also for creating the Our Ocean Conference, which became the platform for leaders to go and make announcements and not just speeches. Well, obviously we have a road to travel still. I'm, I'm proud of what we did. We've, we've actually created millions of square kilometers of marine protected areas. But the challenge, as you know better than anybody, is getting countries to do more than make the announcement, getting them to actually enforce the marine protected area. And we had a goal, obviously, in the next years, ultimately of getting to 30% of the ocean protected. The goal for this year was to get to 10%. And we're just nowhere near it, frankly. Uh, we, you know, some people would argue we have 2%, some people 1%. But in terms of real protection for marine areas, we're probably at about 1%. Would you agree with that? Yeah, depending on how generous you are on defining what protected means. Uh, right. Uh, right. The, I think that is uh, the best data that I have seen suggests that less than 3% of the ocean is in areas that are fully protected from fishing and other damaging activities. And most of these areas are in very large remote reserves like the ones that you help to protect uh, with, with President Obama in, in the Pacific. So before we get into the, this question of what do you do and how do you do it, uh, I want to probe a little bit more and just let all our, our folks who've joined us share a little bit more. Uh, you've written a book called The Nature of Nature. 
And it's really a glorification, if you will, of this incredible uh, biosphere in which we live, the remarkable uh, confluence of all the aspects of nature. I mean, nature is a wonder. You call it a miracle. Uh, I call it a miracle too. I mean, I look at flowers, different flowers, and you look at the different flowers and you say, my God, it's incredible. You look at different fish. It's, 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 uh, if people stopped and really thought about the uh, meaning of all of these different parts of what too many people just take for granted and trample over, and you've really highlighted that in, in your book. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, why, what, what drove you to say, okay, I got to do this. I got to talk to people about nature. And you, you know, a lot of people say, what do you mean? Everybody knows what nature is, but they don't really, do they? Yeah, they don't. It's crazy that, uh, you know, I, for 30 years, I've been studying and learning and doing research and learning from other scientists. And I had all these ideas in my head. Wow, but people don't know the basics. So basically, the book wrote by itself. Um, I just lent my brain a, a computer and I taught, tell stories about how scientists, including myself, figured out how species interact and what happens when they get together and self-assemble creating these wonderful things that we call forests, wetlands, coral reefs, and how miraculous this is, because we cannot recreate what nature does for us for free. It takes billions of dollars to keep four humans alive on the International Space Station, which is the closest, the only space station we have. We cannot create an ecosystem there for them to survive without having to ship all the food up there. So if people, that my thought was if people knew how wonderful the workings of nature are you know it would be so much easier for them to understand that wow you know if it ain't broken don't try to fix it so what do you think why is it that people block i mean some people would block at what you just said and they'd sort of say oh man i know what nature is you know i go outdoors the bird craps on me I, <laughs> you know whatever it is uh, why what is it that people don't understand in your judgment? And why is it people don't understand? And, you know, we can wrap that into sort of development practices. People just kind of, you know, they strip mine a mountaintop or they do you know, a mountaintop clearing or they do strip mining or they, uh, you know, these monofilament nets that some people use in the ocean, just strip mine the ocean. Uh, why is there not a more natural connection uh, to what is around us and to our connection to it. Well, some people do, right? The, the indigenous peoples and, and people who live closer to nature, some farmers and, and fishermen. But yeah, our society has been so disconnected from nature. People living in cities go to the market. There is always stuff there. So, you know, nobody questions where this comes from. And, you know, just to give an example, we, we, need to be, we need to be so much more humble about, about nature because most of the oxygen in the atmosphere, which is vital for us, has been produced by micro, microbes in the ocean, bacteria and microscopic algae for millions of years. And the species that is the most abundant in the ocean that produces most of the oxygen in the world, we didn't discover it until 30 years ago. Wow. So, you know, that's just one example of how ignorant we are and how much more respectful we should be about what keeps us alive. So talk about the why, I mean, why, <clears throat> a lot of people would say, oh, you know, we're gonna have to, the technology, we'll create something to replace it, or we can do this, we can farm the fish. We, you know, what is it that uh, they're missing that just makes that uh, uh, such a callous view of what we ought to be doing? Yeah, well, you know, we are acting like we have five plants. Uh, the way we produce food is so inefficient. You know, in the U.S., for example, 41% of the land is dedicated to raise livestock. You know, we don't need so much land to produce our, our food. 75% of the fresh water we use goes to industrial agriculture and livestock. You know, there's so much waste and, and inefficiency. So even if you think cold-hearted, you know, purely in economic terms, you know, it doesn't make sense to do things the way the way we are doing them. And but you know, we have great examples like indigenous peoples in Brazil. And now with satellite photos, you can see the fires, for example, and you can see the fires all around these indigenous protected areas. 
Now, these people have been able to coexist with their environment in a way that they don't destroy that machine that keeps the forest uh, intact and producing all these services for us. And what are the, as you move around the world and you continue this exploration and as you take part in trying to protect some of these areas, uh, share with us the reason you see such urgency now. Uh, what is the challenge that we face? We have right now this crisis of COVID-19. And many people are saying, wow, this is the most important thing right now. And they think of it separately from the climate crisis and, and the nature crisis. But it's all one and the same. And right now we've reached a point. This pandemic, I think, is the loudest wake-up call for humanity, that we are all connected and that if we tamper with nature on one side of the planet, everybody will be affected. Right? In this case, it's... Someone would stop you and say, well, what's the tampering with, with nature? This is a disease. It kind of mutates or it, it, it has its own being. Why should I you know, be responsible in a sense to my other life choices and activities? What's the connection to COVID? Yeah, well, this virus has jumped from a wild animal to a human in China creating a local outbreak. And thanks to our globalized lifestyle, because everybody's flying around like crazy, it spread like wildfire around the world. But before this, we had HIV, Ebola, Zika, SARS, all these infectious diseases come from wild animals because we move animals around the world like commodities or we destroy their natural habitats. So destruction of nature, tampering with nature in one part of the world, in Africa or China is affecting somebody in Idaho. We, we are all connected. And is there something particular about COVID-19, about the coronavirus, that separates it from Ebola or SARS, et cetera? Or is it just all part of the same family? It just happens to have mutated in a way that's hitting us harder. It's a different type of virus than, than Ebola or, or HIV. But what makes a difference in this case is the globalization where we are now. There's always been diseases that jump from humans to people, but because human groups lived in relative isolation, these outbreaks remain local. But right now, you know, it only takes one person to get on a, on a plane uh, from wherever the outbreak starts to contaminate the entire world. So that movie Contagion from a few years ago, it seemed like science fiction, but it's what's happening now. And of course, we all know that the reality is that after President Trump says he shut down the flights from China, about 40,000, 45,000 people came into the United States. So it wasn't really shut down. Uh, and, and so it's an example of how we are connected. But take us from COVID to the other uh, aspects of, of this connectedness that you see that is so critical right now, that, that creates the urgency. Yeah, there is an example. Uh, my friend, the Minister of Environment of Gabon in West Africa, Lee White, he told me that studies show that the Congo Basin Forest, the tropical forest in DRC, Congo and Gabon, produces a lot of rain. This is the forest that gets the water from the soil and it goes, thanks to the tropical heat, all the way up to the leaves and it transpires. And this moisture then falls as rain and feeds the forest, etc. The Congo Basin Forest produces the rain that waters the highlands of Ethiopia on the other side of the continent. That's the water that produces the rivers and the food for 120 million people in Ethiopia. And it's also the, the highlands that are the source of half of the Nile. So enter Egypt and Sudan, 140 more million people. What happens without the water and the food? Riots, instability, people migrating to Europe, maybe war between Egypt and, and Ethiopia. That's because of the forest on the other side of the continent. So this, this is just one example of how uh, we are all connected. And what is happening to the Congo? It's been, in some cases, like in Gabon, they are doing a great job keeping as much forest covered as possible. DRC still has a huge uh, forest cover, but there are enormous pressures from China mostly for timber and minerals and, and other resources. So local people, uh, many of them in, in, in poverty conditions, are tempted. It's very easy for them to extract these resources in ways that are not sustainable 
to sell them to, to these uh, foreign powers. So the demand for resources in one side of the world is destroying this wonderful ecosystem that it's irreplaceable, which in, in turn will have consequences uh, for security and stability for the entire continent. Uh, have you talked to the political leadership there? I'm, uh, we are working with Gabon, the government of Gabon. They created 13 national parks covering 15% of their land. And they also created 20 marine reserves that cover almost a third of their waters, which is helping to replenish the fisheries of the country. So the government of Gabon is doing a great job in making sure that they keep their natural capital so they will be about able to su the support the people. What about the DRC and the other Congo countries? I, have been, I haven't been uh, working with them. These are very difficult places which also suffer from humanitarian issues. Lots of organizations are working there. And there are, these are one of the most difficult places in the world to, to, to work. At the same time, they are one of the most important for, for global biodiversity, but also for climate. So what needs to happen? How do we, <coughs> excuse me, how do we make sure uh, that there's a, that there's some measure of possibility that we preserve this interconnectedness? Well, Especially I'm pretty... the development pressures coming from a place like China. I mean, China is the most mercantile nation on the planet, uh, and it has a huge appetite, 1.3, three and a half billion people. Uh, they have this massive growing economy and their their production schedule for all kinds of things that they make and ship around the world is such that they need the raw materials and they're writing long-term contracts in country after country. Yes, when it comes to the renewable uh, resources like a forest or, or fisheries, for example, there is this myth that we need to cut more to, to have more agriculture. And we need to fish the ocean more to get more fish. But that's, that's a myth. And actually, uh, the forestry uh, business, the sector, is, is uh, slowing down their growth. Fisheries globally are shrinking. They have negative growth as an economic sector. And we have uh, produced risk percent of their waters. They would get a net increase in fish. Because these protected areas, as you know very well, they produce so many fish that help, through a spillover of fish, they help to replenish the areas around. So if they protected the right 30%, the spillover would, would exceed the foregone catch. So instead of going around the world to catch more, they should, every country should protect more of their waters on average 30%, and they would get better, uh, more benefits immediately. But do you hear governments uh, actually listening and responding to this, or do you find them just falling into this develop, develop, develop uh, syndrome? Yeah, there are a few countries that are living on what we could call the blue-green recovery after COVID, not propping up the industries of the past, but actually investing in industries of the future. The European Commission has a very ambitious proposal to protect 30% of Europe by 2030 and going carbon neutral by 2050. And then we have, as you know very well, uh, our friends in Chile, they have already protected 42% of their waters. Other countries like Seychelles, 30%, Palau, 80%. So there are a bunch of countries there that have realized that there is no future if they don't set aside some, some areas as principle that will produce returns that they will be able to enjoy in the long term. And it's true, is it not, that uh scientists, particularly marine biologists and others, tell us that in order to have a chance of protecting the cycle of crop, of, of, of the stocks of fish, um, that you've got to have about 30% of the ocean overall protected. Is that right? That's correct. If we protected the right 30% of the ocean, we would get an increase in, in fishing catch. And tell and right now, tell tell folks what it means. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. And no, right no. Now, what? Right now, right now, 82 percent of the fish stocks are overfished. Right. And in uh, the mid 90s, we reached peak fish. The the catch of wild fish has been declining since the 90s. So fishing more is not going to get us more fish. We need to set aside these areas to help replenish the rest of the ocean. <clears throat> well, as I've said many times at our ocean conferences. There's too much money chasing too few fish. 
And when you get a lot of money out there, I'll tell you, there was an article recently, Ian Urbina is a, uh, a reporter, who used to report for the New York Times. I think he's left the Times now and he's written a book called Outlaw Ocean. And it writes, uh, he's, very much, he's very effectively chronicled the various criminal activities that take place on our oceans. But he particularly has also been focused on what's happening with the fisheries. And, and recently he wrote a story, uh, I think it was a big front page story in the New York Times, maybe a month ago, two months ago, somewhere, about uh, China and the large fleets that go out illegally into zones and then these small boats go out from the big you know, sort of factory ship and they go into the economic zone of a country and just fish the hell out of it and come back and they, they process it right there on ship, boom, it goes back to China, winds up in the restaurants and people are happy. But with 450 million Chinese having discovered sushi, that search for, for, for fish, for the blue tuna, is going to be uh, the end of the blue tuna, ultimately, unless people are obeying the law, and they're not obeying the law. So what do we do about this? Well, we need uh, several things. One, we need these areas to help replenish the rest of the ocean. But we need to be able to discuss with the Chinese leadership that more exploitation doesn't need more supply of fish into the future, that's not sustainable. They are already doing a huge deal of aquaculture. That's uh, going to be uh, what's going to replace much of this wild fish that uh, has been disappearing. But what we need is more international uh, cooperation. And you were key uh, when you were Secretary of State to develop that Port States Measures Agreement. Yeah. But also, we need a new instrument for conservation. Tell people, tell people what we do with the Port State Measures. So. Basically, if a satellite, a satellite detects illegal activity in my country, but I don't have a, a navy, I cannot uh, chase the, the illegal fishermen. When the port, uh, when the, that illegal fishing boat goes into your exclusive economic zone, you will enforce for me. That's one example of very practical of how international cooperation is, going, is helping to substitute for the lack of enforcement in the water for many countries. And it also has a mechanism by which it guarantees that when a fisherman brings their, their uh, catch into a port, that port is going to be able to determine where those fish were caught and whether or not they were caught legally. And if the fisherman is not able to show precisely what his fishing pattern was and where it was, he won't be allowed to sell the fish. So that doesn't mean they can't get sold illegally on a black market, and some do. That's part of the problem of enforcement. But people don't realize, you know, everybody, you walk into a restaurant, you sit down and you see, wow, I got cod and haddock and, you know, uh, striped bass and halibut and whatever. But people have no idea how it was caught, where it was caught, how much is there, whether it's going to be there in another year or two years. We have to be able to preserve uh, the capacity to make this fishery sustainable, all fisheries sustainable. And uh, you, you put your finger right on a major problem, which is uh, the, out of the 18 or so major fisheries of the world, uh, nine of them are overfished and the others are at peak and uh, near peak. There are about one or two that aren't at quite peak. Uh, the Norwegians do a very good job. The Irish do a pretty good job. There are a number of nations that are fishing countries and for years have been centuries and they do a good job, but there are terrible actors out there who undo all the good that a lot of nations are trying to do. Well, if I may, what we need also is a, a secretary of state like you. We need diplomats who think multilaterally, who think globally about uh, the interconnectedness of the world. Well, we need to think about the interconnectedness of the world on a whole bunch of issues, uh, obviously. Um, not just the oceans and fisheries and climate, but uh, cyber warfare, nuclear weapons, uh, the great poverty of the world, which is a real problem in terms of uh, development and populism, nationalistic populism that appeals to people who don't have a lot and who blame it on somebody. Uh, we have some real challenges on, on the planet right now. And obviously we have a critical 
election here in America in a matter of days um, where we will decide what kind of country America is really going to be um, because it's going to take important leadership to move us in the right direction on these issues. We have a lot of catching up to do, as you know. What do you think is the most critical uh, name some of the, share with people where you see some of the most critical areas where biodiversity or habitat is really threatened. And whether it's on land or sea, we need to be thinking about how we're going to protect the long term. Yeah, places that are on everybody's mind are the tropical forests, which are the biggest sinks of carbon, uh, which will help us mitigate climate change on the land. We're talking about the Congo forest the Amazon, the forest in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, etc. But also the boreal forest, the northern forest of Canada and Russia are super important as the tundra and the permafrost and the peat bog, all these Arctic ecosystems, which are also melting fast. These would be the, the, the two key ones for the land. <coughs> Let's talk about that for a minute, Enrique, because a lot of people really haven't focused on what's happening now and the danger of what is happening now. Uh, the areas in the far north uh, of Alaska, Canada, uh, Russia, uh, other countries uh, are thawing. The permafrost that has been frozen for what, 40,000 years or mm -hmm. more, where there weren't humans with this human activity. Uh, and now suddenly you have human activity emitting gas that is 20 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. Carbon, carbon dioxide is the main culprit for uh, climate, but it's not the only culprit. There are other greenhouse gases, and one of those is methane. Methane is 20 times more damaging. It doesn't last as long as carbon dioxide, but while it's alive, while it's there working, uh, it does 20 times the damage. And we can ill afford to have gases increasing that are going to do 20 times the damage to carbon dioxide because that means 20 times every day uh, you're going to have to find a way to mediate or to mitigate uh, or, or adjust to that. We don't have a method yet. So uh, most people see this as, as really dangerous. There are places in Russia where they used to be farming and now the land is completely undulating because of this thawing of the permafrost. Perhaps you could shed a little light on, on sort of what you've seen about that and, and how dangerous that really is for us. Yes, this permafrost is this frozen uh, soil that, as you said, has been frozen for tens of thousands of years. And th that soil contains a lot of carbon because on the land the biggest carbon sink is the soil, much more than the actual vegetation. The vegetation helps I'll to create people, the soil. Just quickly, you say what a sink is. Most people know. but for a, a, a sink is a place where carbon is locked and remains uh, locked forever. That's what we thought would happen with the permafrost. You have this soil that is uh, frozen, sometimes uh, several feet deep, and that <coughs> soil is, is locked in there. It doesn't go anywhere. And we thought that the carbon in that soil would remain there forever. But because of the warming uh, temperatures of the planet, the, the ice on that soil is melting. And that's helping microbes to uh, work, um, use the nutrients on that soil to release, uh, to release a lot of greenhouse gases. Then there is a lot of methane that was formed by, you know, the accumulation is like fossil fuels, the accumulation of all this organic matter the dead plants and animals for, for millions of years, that uh, once the ice is gone, all that carbon can be released uh, through the atmosphere. And you, you probably have seen these videos uh, of uh, bubbles uh, th that come through the ice and people you know, just um, people flaming. They match. They light yeah. a match and you can see, you can, and it burns. It burns. It burns. You can see it burning on the ocean or burning on the land, but you light where this methane is coming up. It's just, it's scary. It is very scary. Very, very scary. It's one of the big challenges we face today. One of the things, I just put in a quick advertisement here, that uh, Vice President Biden has put in his plan 
is to try to put people back to work by becoming involved in plugging the old mines, the methane where mines, uh, where it's leaking out and find other places where it's possible to try to capture that methane. But uh, we have to be creative and we have to be pretty, uh, pretty swift in doing more in order to deal with this challenge. It's quite astonishing to me that despite the reality of being able to light a match on bubbles coming out of the ocean and see the fire and you know it's methane and it's going up into the atmosphere, despite that, we have a president in the United States who has pulled us out of the climate agreement and thinks that uh, uh, you know reversing uh, years of efforts to have clean air and clean water somehow is gonna make the world better. We're in a pretty tough place here, uh, given that. You don't have to comment, you're not involved in that, but um, I just wanted to mention to people that there is really a confrontation with truth right now uh, and evidence. And, and people have declared war on science, which is quite astonishing. Uh, so uh, we have our work cut out for us, obviously. Uh, share with uh, folks, if you would, um, the uh, marine, I wanna come back to the marine protected area and confident ocean effort. What is, uh, share with people how this incredibly big, vast ocean, three quarters of our planet, is ocean. I mean, we could have been called ocean, not earth, but it's three quarters ocean. And people look at it and they say, well, you know, if there's a little bit of junk that goes into it, it's not a problem. It'll just consume biodegradable, it'll work out. And yet the biggest threats to the ocean today are overfishing, pollution, and the acidification that takes place from the CO2 the, the carbon and the particulates that drop into the ocean with the rain dissolve and it changes the chemistry of the ocean itself. So why should people say, well, this great vast organic entity is not going to be able to deal with all of this by itself. And we actually have to do something to protect an ocean. I can't believe someone would say, I can't believe the ocean is really threatened. Yes. <clears throat> The plastic thing is really scary, and I hope that we'll have some time to talk about the good news. But uh, the the you know we have been conducting expeditions with National Geographic pristine seas all around the ocean, and everywhere we go, we collect water samples, one liter water samples. In eighty percent of the samples, we have found microplastics. In the Arctic, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we have turned the ocean into a plastic soup, you know, and this is impossible to clean. And we do know that the fish and the oysters and mussels, they filter or eat microplastics. And there is microplastic in the fish that you can find in the supermarket. And microplastic has been found in human poop also. It doesn't just come from the ocean because it's raining on us, we breathe it. So the way we have polluted the planet is completely unprecedented and, and nobody can ignore it because uh, we still don't know what are the effects of microplastic on our health, but Everybody be sure that you have ingested a bunch of microplastics today. It's, it's frightening. And, and if, we continue, if we continue to put the amount of plastic we're currently putting into the ocean over these next years, by the year 2030 something, I believe, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Yeah, that's plastic where, is going up and fish are going down. That's where we're currently headed, agreed. Well, Enrique, uh, um, so how uh, help people, all of us, to understand, to win this battle, how much of the planet do we need to protect and why? Yeah, the science is telling us that if we want to prevent the extinction of one million species of plants and animals and all the benefits they provide to humanity, if we want to prevent the collapse of our life support system, and if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, we need half of the planet in natural state, which means that we have to start by protecting 30% of the planet, the right 30% of the planet, land and sea, by 2030. 30% by 2030. That gives us 10 years, my friend. To double the surface of the land that is currently protected 
and quadruple the ocean surface that is protected. And what does that mean in terms of protecting the land? What, what, is, the, what is the definition of protection at that point? We need to do no more harm. We need to preserve what we have left, those big forests. And in many cases, it's protected areas in places where there are no people, where nobody can touch anything. But in many other places, indigenous peoples have done a fantastic job protecting their own lands, like in, in the Amazon and, and Africa and in other places. So indigenous peoples' lands and protected areas in the conventional sense are allies to, to save not only the lands and, and cultures, but protecting the places that are left are, is not enough. Because if we restored many of the degraded lands, if we raised less livestock, because we don't need to eat as much meat as we eat, actually, we would have more <coughs> land to give back to nature. So we can restore, there is this trillion tree uh, project of the World Economic Forum. There are projects on rewilding, uh, rewilding Europe, restoring, reintroducing the large animals like the bison and the wolf. And these animals help to restore the entire ecosystem. They bring everything back and they help the ecosystems capture much more carbon, also helping to mitigate climate change. So that's why we need uh, 30%, or critical 30% of the land and ocean. And what's it going to take to get there? There is a high ambition coalition of countries, 33 countries already, including Costa Rica and France are the co-chairs. We have Canada, the UK, the European Commission, Gabon, and a bunch of countries around the world, 33, that have already committed to this global target of 30% protection. And this is something that is going to be agreed at the conference of the parties of the UN Convention on Biodiversity in China next year, in May. So that's going to be the time and the place where the countries of the world are going to meet and decide how much more space we are willing to give to nature. So that's the, that's the key date, we have a deadline. So we need to go from these 33 countries to 196 countries. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's a tall, it's a big lift, isn't it? It is because there are countries that have a lot of biodiversity like Brazil that are not helping right now. They are against uh, nature and against science. It would be great if the United States also led, that would help bring many more countries like uh, you did for, for the Paris Climate Agreement. So at this point, we need, we need political leadership to make this happen. Well, that's exactly why in whatever it is, 30 some days from now, so many Americans have a unique opportunity to be able to help make a contribution to turning this around. Uh, because I know that Vice President Biden is deeply committed to uh, being able to move in, in, in exactly the direction that you have described. Um, one of the hurdles to doing this is the pushback you get from people who say, oh, I can't, we can't do that. It's too much money. How are you gonna spend all that money you know, and, and I'm going to lose my job. It's going to take my job away and it's too expensive. Uh, so um, they wind up saying, uh, you know, you just can't, uh, uh, you can't afford to do it, I guess, is the fundamental argument you keep hearing. Um, obviously, that's a problem. It, it's also not really correct. You want to speak to that? Exactly. It's, it, is, it is a myth. This, this is a myth, right? The question is not, can we afford it? But how can we afford not to? Just an example for the US, for every dollar that, we, that the government invests in our national parks, that produces $10 in economic output. That's a 10 to one economic return. That's extraordinary. And this year, actually, we produced an economic report to answer this question because the ministers of finance of countries were asking us, how much is going to cost? I cannot afford it. And we found that on average, protecting 30% of the planet would cost $140 billion per year. <coughs> That's only a third of the protecting government subsidies, $140 billion per year. Protect That's the cost, 30% of the land and the sea. But that's, that may seem like a lot of money for some people, but this is only a third of the money that governments pay to subsidize the activities that destroy nature. Fossil fuel, direct handouts to fossil fuel companies and the most harmful industrial, agricultural and fisheries practices. 
And also, this 140 billion is less than what the world spends today on video games. <laughs> wow. The money is there. The money is there. And also, for every dollar invested in nature, dollar would give us at least five dollars in return. So, from a, an economic perspective, I mean, that is the right thing to do. What's the best reading you would recommend to people on that? What book should they read or what, uh, apart from the, the nature of nature? But um, is there a place that you particularly think this is easily and well laid out? Yeah, well, thank you for the plug. I would suggest that people buy The Nature of Nature. <laughs> but there is a, the Campaign for Nature has uh, this report on the, the first report on how, what would be the economic costs and benefits. There is a, po a summary for uh, policymakers, a highlight. So if people go to campaignfornature.org.org, there is a, a link to the, to the report in there. .org. I'm writing it down. I want to see that part. I was about to say that Sir Nicholas Stern, uh, a friend of ours, has written uh, a terrific book about the economics and why we're going to spend trillions of dollars in order to mitigate and adapt and do all the things that we could have avoided if we had taken the steps to prevent the climate crisis from growing worse. So we actually have uh, 10 years available to us now, during which time the scientists tell us, if we make the right choices, we have the ability to avoid the worst consequences of climate crisis. Doesn't mean we'll avoid consequences. The, the warming goal, the, the goal of Paris was to keep the warming of the earth at two degrees centigrade. Aspirationally, we set the goal of 1.5 degrees because that's the only way you're going to wind up saving island states and, and many low-lying communities. So today, right now, as you and I are talking, we are at about 1.2 degrees of warming on the planet. So we haven't even reached 1.5, folks, and yet look at what's going on. And, and the real, the more realistic goal that people think we may be able to meet is two degrees. Currently, because of what's not happening in the world, if, if, if we did everything we set out to do in Paris, we would still go up to 3.7 degrees centigrade. And the truth is, we're not doing everything that we set out to do in Paris. So we're headed to 4.1 or 4.5 degrees. <clears throat> That's where the planet is headed right now because of human activities and the unwillingness of leaders to come together to deal with this crisis. The sad thing is dealing with this crisis will create millions of jobs. It actually will create less disease, less cancer, cleaner air, uh, less particulates in the air. Uh, people with COVID will have less crisis. I mean, all kinds of benefits will come from the world moving faster in the direction of a sustainable uh, cycle of renewable energy. Uh, and we, we can discover great things, I'm convinced, if we put more effort into R&D, research and development, and, and be as innovative as so many countries in the world have the ability to be. So we define the future. Human beings uh, have been given this uh, capacity. What, what was uh, Cousteau talked about? Uh, we are more than human beings, correct? He said that uh, we, 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 we can have faith and we can have hope and we can work. So I can't think of a better way for you and me to finish up in terms of uh, this little discussion we've had then calling to mind this notion that Cousteau reminded us what President Kennedy reminded us of when he was inaugurated that, that there isn't a problem that can't be solved that's created by human beings that can't be solved by human beings. So we need to get about the work of doing it. We are on the same team, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much. Well, I love uh, our, our meetings when you and I get a chance to meet. COVID has interrupted those, but I really look forward uh, when we're both able to get back on the trail uh, and make these things happen. And I cannot thank you enough for the great work you are doing uh, with National Geographic. And otherwise, you're, you're one of our 
pioneers and you've got to keep breaking through to bring everybody the truth um, and the picture, the full picture of what is out there, what it means and what we need to do about it. Well, thank you for your leadership, Mr. Secretary. We, we need you. Take care, my friend. Stay, thank you. Stay safe.